We loved him. And you should know that 30 years earlier, the country we live in right now, and God bless it, would not give Sammy his own television special. He had to go to Canada in 1959 to do his own TV special, which you saw a little clip of in, in that film. But the fact that George Slaughter said in 1990, after making him do Here Come the Judge on Laughing, <laughs> I'm not saying he made Sammy a judge. So yes, <laughs> we owe you everything. <laughs> I have no idea how much that man contributed to, not just the shows I did, and Tom and whatever, but the shows that everybody did. He was not just a singer or just a whatever. He was a total genius. He was an event that we never had before. We'll never have another one like that. And you got to be in the house with it. Yes, sir. And, yeah, to hear the reaction of people looking at Sammy now makes you just feel so warm and so full. He was a really, really special person. We love him. This, this thing tonight was a really lovely tribute. I'm glad you all saw it. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. I'd like to also say that one of the people that you uh, saw in the interviews in this documentary was a man named Bert Boyer. Bert Boyer and his late wife, Jane Boyer, co-wrote Sammy's autobiography called Yes, I Can and upgraded it in the 80s called Why Me? And Bert was so good to me personally. When he did the documentary, uh, when he did the, um, the autobiography, he recorded Sammy, your dad, over 85 hours of audio cassette. And after he saw a documentary that I've been working on for 20 years, yes, sir. he said, how can I help you? And I said, my goal is to have your dad narrate his life story. And the next week, Bert Boyer gifted to me the 85 hours of Sammy wow. actually telling his oh story. My God. Now, the last gift that Bert gave me, and it really is, because we're like brothers now. Oh, yes, yes sir. But he gave me the friendship of Manny because he put us together. And I want you to know that Bert and Manny and I were supposed to get together for dinner two weeks ago, and I couldn't get Bert on the phone. And I called Manny, and very, very sadly, we found out Bert died a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Sorry. So when you saw him in here, this is a man who knew Sammy through the Halcyon years, and we were grateful that he was recorded, mm -hmm. and that I know he was a personal friend of yours, mm -hmm. and that if you ever read Why Me or Yes I Can, just understand that Bird was right there with, yeah. with, with and, you. And also at the same time, um, when my mother fell ill in 2009, he and my mother put me in this position where I'm actually the administrator of Sammy's, uh, David Jesus' state. So I control his life rights, and before my father passed away, he put everything into me. So I'm, that's why I've been working with this and stuff, and so that's why I'm here to do this stuff now. So my father found something in me, he did something with his other kids that he didn't do. Yep. And um, I've been working with George, Stan, you know, and um, everybody else with PBS to put this out now, but we're working on the movie with um, Lana Ritchie and Paramount. Oh, and yes. Tom, Tom Greeson also. Uh, a good, Tom probably great family friend. As much as Tom yeah. Greeson probably Well, ladies and gentlemen, give the mic. Give one the of the all-time great, all-round comedians, yeah. actors, and singers who opened for Sammy and Frank Sinatra. This is Tom Greeson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, I can't tell you how moved I was by watching this documentary. I, I toured with Sammy for years in, in cities all over, the, all over the country and sat in the wings night after night watching this incredible human being perform. This man who was born to be in show business. There was no doubt about that's why God put him on this planet. And to sit in the wings and watch him night after night take total command of that stage uh, was like show business 101. I mean, I learned more from him in the years I toured with him than anything else in my career. But I want to share a couple stories with you to show you the humanity of this man who paid more dues than anybody in show business ever had to pay. He truly, the thing that bothers me the most when I watch this documentary and what bothers me the most when I tour around the country, when I talk to young entertainers who haven't got a clue of what he was all about. He was the Jackie Robinson of show business. 
He truly was the Jackie Robinson of show business. <clears throat> For all those young performers who sometimes mimic him and make fun of him sometimes, and don't know his history, they don't know that they wouldn't be where they were if it wasn't for the dues that he paid. Right. Now, that brings me to this story. Uh, he knew that I toured for years. I was with America's first black and white comedy team. History shows we were the last. Tim Reed and I were America's first black and white wow. comedy team. We wrote a book about it that's now going to become a movie. Wh which one were you? <clears throat> I, I, <clears throat> I played the white guy. I did pretty good, too. I mean, <laughs> But uh, Sammy knew that story. In 19, from 1969 to 1975, we toured the nation. There were no comedy clubs in those days, so we worked the Chitlin circuit, as you saw tonight, black-owned, black-operated nightclubs. Sammy knew that was my background. I grew up in, in, a, in the south side of Chicago. I had eight brothers and sisters, and we lived in a shack. We grew up in a predominantly black area. So I played basketball on an all-black basketball team. I played football on an all-black football team. And these were the kind of routines that I did when I met Sammy. I, I had done an album in front of an all-black audience called That White Boy's Crazy. Uh, <laughs> because that's what they call me all my life. I truly, uh, no black guy ever called me a cracker or a hunky where I grew up at. They called me white boy. You know, I was 13 years old when I found out my name wasn't white boy, you know. But, <laughs> but I did my first appearance on The Tonight Show and I wanted to do Sammy's show because I had seen him perform once before and I begged my agent at that time, a woman named Debbie Miller, to get me on the show. She got me on the Sammy and Company TV show, which was done out of Tahoe, if you remember, at Harris. It was called Sammy and Company. <clears throat> and I did the routine about growing up in an all-black neighborhood and all the routines about a white boy in an all-black situation. Sammy said to me on the air, I'm going to take you on the road with me. And he took me on the road, touring all over the country, and in the Mill Run Theater in Chicago, he came to my dressing room one night in between shows, uh, and that's another story I'd love to tell you. <clears throat> I'll, I'll digress for a second. At the Mill Run Theater, it was my hometown, Chicago, and every night the audiences were sensational, and we were knocking them dead. And, and I would do my show, and there'd be an intermission, and Sammy would go out. Each night he'd come to my dressing room and say, how's the crowd? I say, fantastic, they were wonderful. But one night, <clears throat> they weren't. And I just I had a tough time the whole show, and I just barely got through it. He came in my dressing room. He said, he said how's, how's, how's the crowd? I said, mediocre at best. He said, OK. And he went out, and he came back in the door. He said, what did you say? I said, mediocre at best. He said, oh, OK. He went out, and halfway through the show, he got his second standing ovation. He did what kind of fool am I? He got his third standing ovation. He did I got to be me. He got his fourth standing ovation. He closed with Mr. Bojangles. And they couldn't stop cheering, Sammy, Sammy, Sammy. As he walked by me, as he came back to stage, he stopped and he said, you're right, they were a little bit slow tonight. <laughs> Tom, All would I you... did was press a button. But I want to tell you one more quick right. story. Okay. When he took me to Las Vegas... <laughs> This are you, no, are no, you good, Stan? You if you wanna, <laughs> if you wanna lock up when you leave, it's yes, fine. Right. <laughs> By the way, when I'm finished, I'm going too. I don't blame you. <laughs> going into Las Vegas, I had never worked Las Vegas before. <laughs> At the Mill Run Theater, he said to me, "Have you ever worked Las Vegas?" I said, "No." He said, "Will you open there January 15th with me, 1977?" Coming down the strip with Sammy Davis Jr., my first time in Las Vegas, seeing all the names of all the people that I admired all my life. And on the marquee, Sammy Davis Jr. made sure they put my name on the marquee. Big stars in those days sometimes just put their name. The opening act didn't get any billing. When Diana Ross or Tom Jones put their name on the marquee, there wasn't room for you to park in the parking lot. That's how they, their names are big and huge. But Sammy insisted that they put my name on the marquee. And he explained to me, he said, if I put your name on the marquee, every act that you work for when you follow me to, you become a star. They, well, you, we set a precedent. They'll have to give you billing. And he gave me half the billing, 50% billing. He never, ever called me an opening act. He always called me his co-star. That's the kind of, I was his opening act. Of course I was. But Sammy referred to you on the bill. You were a co-star. When we went inside, the conductor, Nat Brandywine, at the rehearsal said, Tom, you'll do 20 minutes. Sammy will do an hour and 10. And those days, they served food at Caesar's Palace. The comedian died, died of death. There was no way you could get the audience in a big high ceiling, and they're all eating dinner, and waiters and waitresses roaming out. Sammy knew that. He told Nat Brandywine, the conductor, he said, this is Tommy's first time in Vegas. So he's got a score. If he scores, they'll bring him back. He said, I'll go out first, and I'll do three or four songs, and then I'll bring Tommy out each night. And Nat Brandywine said, it's your show. 
It's your show, Sammy. And that's how he did it every night. Every night he would do three or four songs. The waiters and waitresses would leave the room, would, would get every out of the room. They'd take food away from people who were just starting to eat because when the, <laughs> when the headliner came out, you had to have that room cleared. After four or five, three or four or five songs, Sammy would then say, this was his line. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout the years, you've stood by me. And through the good times and bad, and I feel like your family. And when people do that for you, family, you want to do something for them, like maybe bring them a gift. I got a gift for you. I saw this kid. That's how he brought me out every night. And I've been working Las Vegas ever since then. All right, that's great. This, give it up for Tom's reason. And I want to just say that the partner that Tom was talking about that he worked with back then was Tim Reed, whom you remember from WKRP in Cincinnati. That was an amazing, oh, yeah, like, amazing oh, performance. Yeah, right. So let me ask you a question. Manny Davis is probably one of the family members that we know the least of. Yes. Because you were obviously uh, Altavi's uh, child. So tell us a little bit about that whole thing. Okay, so like, I'm the only son of Altavis Davis and Sammy Davis Jr. Um, the one woman that he was with m more than any woman ever combined. So he, he spent the last 20 years of his life with this woman that he uh, met working on Broadway when he did um, Golden Boy. Uh, they did a London production of it and he actually, um, he didn't even recognize her to be honest with you. He was like, who is this lady? And one of the um, um, co-actors were like, you, you dumbass, like, that's, she played your sister for like two weeks right now. You don't even recognize who she is? So he fell in love with her and um, he, he stayed with her for 20 years till, till his death. And when he passed away in um, uh, Manny, 1990. May, may, may I point out that your father was with a few women. Oh, 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 and a, a few? Like, what do you a mean few, by a few? Yeah, we, well, we, we lost, we had to use an abacus to keep track. Yeah, we, we had to stop at 35. 35. Like. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, anyway, I just wanted, okay. Oh, no, no, no. The funniest part is, like, when I look at all these women pictures. Women loved, women loved Sammy Davis. <clears throat> and they just adored him, and he, he was the best, you know. I, I have a lot of pictures of those women. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to let you know that I spoke to a dear friend of Sammy's. Um, she's been a friend of mine for about 15 years, and she sent me a note, and I thought you'd like to hear this. Wow. This is a friend of Sammy's, Angie Dickinson. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Policewoman. First of all, it's amazing that I say my friend Angie Dickinson. She wrote, <laughs> I'm sorry I can't be with you this evening but I wanted to express my thoughts on Sammy. I loved Sammy. We worked together on Ocean's Eleven. I made eight trips with Sammy doing the Sammy Davis Jr. telethons for the needy children of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. He had such a big heart and gave his all. I will always love Sammy. I will always miss him. And I also say hi to my pals on the panel. Angie Dickinson. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we play poker together. Angie is a great poker player. Really? So we, yeah, we have, we've been playing poker together for years. By the way, I knew Altavis very well. I knew your mom. And when I toured with Sammy, his, his father also toured with us. We called him Daddy Sam. And he would tell us stories about your dad. You know, the story that I'll never forget, he told me one time, Sammy's father said, when they had the Will Maston dance group, it was when Sammy was, was a little boy, it was just Will Maston and, and your grandfather and Sammy's dad. He said, and Sammy would sit in the wings. He was like three years old. He would sit in the wings and he'd watch his dad and his uncle, uh, that he called his uncle, dance every night. And they would close with a, a buck and wing, you know, ba da ba pow ba da pow And Sammy would watch it. And one night, Sammy wandered out on stage and he closed with his dad and his uncle. He was just mimicking them. And the audience went wild. And, and, and Will Maston, who was also a good businessman, said, ooh, we got to keep this kid in yak. One show a night, that's all. They do like five shows a night. And Sammy was allowed to do the closer, what they call bows, to take a bow, take bows with his dad and his uncle. 
So every night, Sammy would sit there, and the stagehands built a little rocking chair for him. And so he would sit in the rocking chair and wait to take his bows every night. And his dad would tell that story, how every night he'd close, and then they would take Sammy back to the hotel. Sammy was so tiny, he actually slept in a drawer in the hotel. His dad told me they actually pulled a drawer out, and Sammy slept in that drawer. And his dad said one night, they were closing the show, doing the bows, and Sammy's father looked into the wings, and he saw Sammy had fallen asleep in the rocking chair. He had just fallen asleep. So they closed the show, and his dad picked up Sammy, and they got him in a the car. They were driving him back to the hotel, and Sammy woke up. He said he woke up, and his dad said he realized where he was. And he, with his little fist, he started pounding his dad's chest. He said, you didn't let me take my bowels. You didn't let me take my bowels. And he said, from that time on, we never ever stopped Sammy from taking a bow. From three years old to so <laughs> see, died. see, like, like I, I'm gonna tell you something different from that one. Um, I'm never gonna have that problem because, like, the one question I'm asked all the time is like, "Oh, can you sing?" And I'm like, "You know how you sound good in the shower? I need like six going on at the same time, and I suck ass." <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, I do. I don't sing, but like I, I do. I dance a little bit, you know. But when my father passed away in 1990, um, he was actually putting me um, in the middle of all the like. I, I could play the piano. I could play the drums. I could play the guitar. I could tap dance. I can write. I could do all these things. But when he passed away, I had to stop doing all this stuff because the money ran out. The friends ran out. Everything went away, and so I had to sit there and spend the 20 years of my life after my father passed away until my mother fell ill in 2009, and now I'm in charge of all this stuff. But like my father did for me what he didn't do for his other kids. He made sure that I uh, would be in a position to carry on his legacy. So that's why I wanted to just, just sit there and thank everybody here <laughs> That, that is still fans of Sammy Davis Jr. Because we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to do this together. It's a story that should be told. That's all I have to say about that one. I want to ask George a question, a very okay. important question. What's that? Mr. Schlatter, for those of us who, and many of us in this room, do remember when Sammy appeared on your celebrated series, Laughing, he was famous for um, a phrase that he... Yeah. Said. What, what had happened was, you have to understand, Sammy Davis raised more money for more charities in more places all over the world than maybe anybody. And if anybody needed anything, if anybody wanted anything, Sam was there. And so one night, we were doing laughing. It just started, and it was like the fourth week, and it was just getting started. And Sammy came by the office, and we were, had done this thing in a courtroom with the judge and doing things. And Sammy said, do you remember Pygmy Markham? I said, no, and he came in and he did that, here come the judge. Well, it, we now went out in the back and we taped those here come the judge things in the white, white wig, right? And he did them, just ad lib, and we then interrupted and put it on the show the next night. Now that was a Monday night, put it on the show Monday night. Wednesday, when the Supreme Court came into the chambers, somebody in the back of the court said, hey, here come the judge. And the biggest laugh they ever got in the Supreme Court. And from there on, it just took off. And it was like, it became, but Sammy Davis, Sammy Davis was an event. You just saw, you were treated to look at a true, unique, unbelievably talented man who meant more to our business than maybe anybody. And uh, you were privileged to see a wonderful, wonderful look at him. And that's just the beginning of what he did. He did forever. Anyhow, you were lucky to be here, and I am too. Right, uh, Frank Sinatra said that Sammy Davis Jr. was a parade. He said Sammy Davis Jr. could do it all. You know, if you talk about uh, singing, Frank said he never heard Sammy hit a clinker. And Frank would hit one once in a while. Sammy never, he, was, he could sing as good as anybody out there. He could dance better than anybody out there. He could do comedy as good as any comedian I ever met. He could do impressions better than any impression out there. He could play the piano, he could play the drums, he could play the trumpet. There wasn't anything he couldn't do on the stage. 
He was, he was born to be what he was. I mean, there's never, I mean, it's, it's a cliche of all cliches, but uh, he was the f first of his kind, and by the way, he was the last of his kind, too, you know. For those uh, of you that are here for the LA Jewish Film Festival, I want to bring up a very important point, because for those of us who have been here for many years, thanks to Hillary and the incredible films that she's put together. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> Um, I want to mention something that some of you who may have read this, you, you know, and if you don't, it'll be interesting. Back in the 50s, uh, Sammy said that the first time he experienced anything of racial prejudice was when he entered the army. And there was a, a gentleman there who was calling him terrible names that I won't repeat tonight, but you'll know what they are. And Sammy was frequently beaten up in the army by some of his fellow army inductees. And there was one fella who said terrible things to him and Sammy punched him and knocked him out. And the guy got up and said, I don't care that you knocked me down. You're still a, and you'll always be a. Yeah, that one. <laughs> well, fast forward to 1970s. Sammy Davis was invited at Richard Nixon's request to spend the night in the White House the first African-American ever to do so since Frederick Douglass, by the way. And when he yes, was sir. there, when he approached the gate, a guard stopped the car to make sure that everything was fine and saw Mr. Davis and said, oh, yes, sir. And Mr. Davis said, do I know you, sir? And he said, no, sir, Mr. Davis, I don't know you. Sammy instantly remembered this was the man that he knocked down who told him yep. that he was always <laughs> going to be a... Uh, Hmm. And he gave him a, a soldier salute because he had to. <laughs> you should always remember that we as the Jewish people who have experienced trouble throughout our history, we're not the only ones. And Sammy experienced it himself, but rose above it and spent the night in the freaking White House. Well, I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, right. when, when Sammy Davis Jr. died, Irv Kupsinet from Chicago asked me for a quote. What's the difference between the entertainer today and the entertainer then? And I said, entertainers today try to electrify an audience with technology, like laser lights. Go Sammy you. Davis Jr. was a laser light. I close with that. Thank you for coming tonight. We hope you continue watching all these great films at the LA Jewish Film Festival. Thank you Thank very you much, all. everybody.